Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. Does the start of Donald Trump's presidency mark the beginning of a political revolution? Or is Trump a quirk of history and a short-term protest phenomenon? Said differently, is Trump an accident of history, or will he make history? To crosstalk the Trump phenomenon, I'm joined by my guest, Bradley Blakeman in Washington. He is a professor at Georgetown University and a former member of President Bush Sr.'s White House staff. Also in Washington, we have Bruce Fine. He is a constitutional lawyer and a former associate deputy attorney general under President Ronald Reagan. And in Los Angeles, we cross to H.A. Goodman. He is a columnist and journalist published in the Huffington Post, Salon, The Hill, and other publications. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Bradley, let me go to you first here. Um, my first question originally was going to be, are, are we seeing a Trump revolution? Let's put that to the second question here. Uh, I was watching the pictures coming out of Berkeley uh, a few days ago before that we had this uh, quote-unquote spontaneous uprising over uh, what's called the Muslim ban, which is not a Muslim ban. Uh, in the executive order, there's no word Muslim, Islam, or Christianity. Um, so my first question to you, is the mainstream media aiding and abetting social unrest and violence in the United States with the advent of the Trump presidency? Unfortunately, the answer to that is yes. What they can accomplish in print or uh, on television or radio, uh, they do by inciting the streets so that they can cover that unrest, which validates their, their uh, reporting. Uh, it's unfortunate, but these are neither spontaneous uh, demonstrations, nor are they focused. They're all over the place. But one thing they have in common is the delegitimization of Donald Trump. That is their mission, moveon.org, Progress for America, other left-wing uh, 501c4s uh, are gathered in financing yep. this unrest. It's clear buses just don't show up, people don't show up, lunches don't show up, pre-printed signs don't show up. This is all organized. H.A., in Los Angeles, you know, in watching all of these protests since the inauguration of Donald Trump, if you don't have women and men walking around in vagina suits in New York, you have in Berkeley, California, <laughs> the origins of the free speech movement. I stress that, the origins of it in the 1960s. And then you see a campus being burned or violence being committed and threats being made against people because of the editor of Breitbart uh, showing up. He wasn't allowed. He didn't speak in the end. So sp free, uh, free speech wasn't honored here. I mean, I look at these pictures and I think of the red states in America, and they must be appalled by what they see on the coasts. Okay, go ahead. Well, my philosophy on that is you let Milo Yiannopoulos speak. I and agree. You defeat any of his, lo uh, his logic. Or, yeah, or you defeat his argument right. uh, by a counter argument. So I'd right. love to debate him. I disagree right. with uh, him on Islam and a whole bunch of other things. Sure. But the issue is you get a President Trump when you cheat Bernie Sanders. So Bernie Sanders had the original political revolution. We okay. could have had the most progressive president since FDR. You cheat Bernie, you get Trump. Um, the, they elevated Donald Trump. So you have to find out why this is taking place. What are the origins of a Trump presidency? The origins take place in the Clinton campaign. We learned from the WikiLeaks Podesta emails that they wanted and they elevated Donald Trump because they thought he was too extreme. They thought that he was a great candidate for Hillary Clinton to face. The strategy backfired miserably for Democrats. Then you had the media and you had 538, you had all these public relations firms saying that Hillary was going to win by a landslide. She lost. She lost the Electoral College. The big issue with that is Wisconsin hasn't voted for a Republican since 1984. Michigan and Pennsylvania haven't voted for a Republican since 1988. So the point is if you had a united Democratic Party under somebody like Bernie Sanders, who was uniting people, who stood for everything that every faction within the Democratic Party stands for, you could have defeated okay. Trump. Instead, you chose a person under FBI criminal investigation, and you lost. Okay. Bruce, you know, weigh in there because, you know, uh, uh, the way I look at this uh, uh, Trump phenomenon is uh, I look at it as fighting the establishment, okay? Because the, the war in Yemen is still going on, okay? Nothing changed with the inauguration and, and a lot of other foreign policy issues uh, remain the same. Uh, but internally in the United States, it seems to me if, if, it, if he's an accident of history, it, is, it may be an accidental revolution given the, re the reactions to his inauguration. 
inauguration and some of the things that I think are really actually quite mundane that he's done in office already, though the media will give you a very different perspective. Go ahead, Bruce. Uh, first, I would say that uh, Donald Trump destroyed two dynasties, the Clinton dynasty and the Bush dynasty. You know, both had huge amounts of money. They were the epitome of the establishment. Both of them are now museum pieces politically. Secondly, I think uh, it relied upon a famous Russian author named Leo Tolstoy. He understood that the dynamics of history are not the dynamics of any particular individual, even someone as uh, deified as Napoleon. You have underlying dynamics of institutions, and even though it's true that Donald Trump has got, he, he's got a new style, he's more abrasive to the media, <laughs> Uh, we still have a military-industrial counterterrorism complex, a multi-trillion dollar. Uh, as you point out, we're still running nine wars all around the globe. Uh, we haven't done anything to diminish our effort to uh, uh, suggest we're the locomotive of mankind and everybody else is in the caboose. And that's just a staggering, staggering amount of what the federal government does. We have special forces in 130 countries. You know, we're committed to defending at least 69 countries, if not more. And none of that is diminished. That's what's driving, you know, the United States of America as others see us. Internally, it's true, we have some debates over funding Planned Parenthood. But that's trivial compared to the warfare state we've been <coughs> accelerating, you know, ever since 9-11. You know, Bradley, I want to touch back on this point here about accidents in history and, re and revolutions, because it seems to me the treatment of Trump by the media in itself starts creating a political force, because if anybody was watching for the last 18, 19 months, is that the more you bully the, the public, the more they, they come out against the establishment. And like Trump or not, he intuitively understands that, and some of his important people around him also understand that. Go ahead, Bradley. Well, look, neither Bernie Sanders, I would allege, or Donald Trump are accidents of history. They're caused by the dysfunction yep. of government in the macro sense and in the micro, yep. the, the incompetence of the parties uh, that they had represented. Uh, the Democrats weren't representing uh, the base of their party. Bernie Sanders got screwed by his own Democratic Party. Uh, the Republicans tried to do it to Trump initially, and he overcame it. And then they, the, the Republican establishment stepped back and said, well, maybe he'll fall on his own sword. And he didn't. He beat 16 opponents. He became the nominee. Republicans let the process play out. The Democrats screwed the process. And at the end, Donald Trump won. Why? Is because he was the outsider, the ultimate outsider in an insider's game. And the American people said, you know what? We know what we got with the insiders. We're not so sure what we got with the outsider. But, you know, it's worth the gamble. And Donald Trump is not an accident at all. He's a cause of the failure of the, of the parties and of the process. H.A., weigh in on that, because, you know, hey. let, me, let me go to Los Angeles here. You know, it's really interesting to me is that, you know, there are people that want to start some kind of investigation, impeachment of, of Trump and all that. But you're absolutely right, and, and I keep stressing it, you know, the Democratic Party screwed Bernie uh, Sanders, and, and you know what? There's no internal reflection upon that. And I think a lot of people are very disillusioned with that, because it's very selective who's right and who's wrong here, when there's a stack of evidence that, you know, there was wrongdoing there. And I think, again, the average person says, this is not fair. And I think this is also adding the fuel to the sense of resentment against the establishment. Go ahead. Well, exactly. And what took place uh, before this election is that when President Obama entered the Yemen <clears throat> war, there was hardly any talk about it. And now you yep. hear when, with President Trump, there's a lot of talk. Very when, good point. Pre when President Obama uh, destabilized, thank you, when President Obama destabilized Libya with Hillary Clinton, it was just, well, smart power and it didn't work out. Uh, with Trump, he's going to be scrutinized uh, in far greater detail. The point is this, when the Democratic Party looks at President Obama, and according to NBC News, there was a 25 percent poverty rate within the African-American community when President Bush left office. It is now over 27 percent. It increased under President Obama. Yep. Democrats are not talking about that. Furthermore, in terms of the big issues, breaking up too big to fail banks, ending perpetual counterinsurgency wars, uh, uh, pushing for a single payer, uh, reinstating Glass-Steagall, Democrats don't talk about those issues. It's always the safest issues no. for a, a No, a, a you know what you get? You get, so, Chuck, you get Chuck Schumer yeah, crying in public. 
you know, crying in public, okay, <laughs> when his own president did exactly the same thing or more or less the same thing. I mean, Chuck Schumer crying in public, that tells you there's something really wrong about America, a man that never earned one penny outside of politics. Anyway, before we go to the break here, Bruce, you wanted to weigh in there. Go ahead. Yes, I just I, I think that um, it's it's a plague on both your houses. The okay. Republicans were equally silent when President Bush was in office, and then they turn around and then condemn Obama. The problem is we have unity between the Democrats and Republicans on this perpetual warfare. It's just not Yemen and Libya. It's Somalia. It's Iraq. It's Afghanistan. It's you know we're we're ready to go to war with Iran and told the Chinese that they can't visit an island in the South China Sea. We're going to deny them access. We have the largest military budget by far in all of the world, and we're going to increase it. So this is what the problem is, and we won't discuss it. It's what's gobbling up and starving our infrastructure of money. We're spending trillions of dollars. We got 8,000 military veterans who commit suicide a year because they come back with PTSD because they don't even know why they're fighting. And we have no discussion among Republicans or Democrats. That's okay. disgraceful. Let me, go to, let me go to Bradley before we go to the break here. Bradley, I, I, I've asked a number of times, 30 seconds, can a Trump build a movement, okay? Because I'm not convinced the movement is out there. Go ahead, Bradley. Yes, he can. And the only way he can do that is by results. The American people demand uh, his promises be kept. Uh, it's a 50-50 nation. He's got a real challenge not only to pander to his base on promises, but also reach out to the other 50 percent. But I'll tell you this, so far, so good. He's making good on a lot of his promises. His biggest one was the Supreme Court. Okay, gentlemen, we're gonna, I'm going to jump in here. We're going to go to a short break, and after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on the Trump phenomenon. Stay with our team. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter LaBelle. To remind you, we're discussing the Trump phenomenon. Okay, I'd like to go back to H.A. in Los Angeles. Right before the break, Bradley was saying that uh, uh, he sees a, a movement coming into, uh, into place, a Trump movement, uh, we could call it that at this point. H.A., I think it's really interesting. It's not necessarily what Trump does, but it's what the opposi opposition does, the media and the Democrats, because we go back to Chuck Schumer. I mean, at, at the inaugural ad address, he came out with the very typical identity politics thing, which is... That's what people voted against here. And we continue to see this here. This is what's going to give fuel to a Trump movement, less to what maybe what Trump is actually going to do. I mean, it's like, you know, the Democrats are a circular firing squad. You know, don't get in the way. Just let them fire. Go ahead. Well, uh, my friend Tim Black has a great uh, segment on that. But, you know, the, the issue with identity politics and the Democratic Party, the Trump presidency and any movement that he could create uh, is fueled by hypocrisy on the left. So when the Democratic Party uh, spreads a memo among congressional Democrats sta stating, do not offer Black Lives Matter concrete policy solutions, this is what was actually yeah. given to members of Congress on the Democratic side. So when you have that, and the Democratic Party is supposed to protect the interests of black voters, and then you have a, a memo sent, don't offer concrete policy solutions, that is the hypocrisy that Trump feeds on. So any movement that Trump's going to build is going to be, um, you know, the Hillary Clinton uh, type of, she was advised by neoconservatives, she pushed for Iraq and Libya. A lot of Democrats um, are very cozy to Wall Street. You have, for example, Cory Booker voting against affordable uh, medicine. Uh, you have Cory Booker also joint legislation with Jeff Sessions just several years back, honoring civil rights activists. So the point is there's so much hypocrisy in the Democratic Party, and Trump fuels uh, Trump's whatever Trump's movement or what it could be is fueled by the hypocrisy from the left. Yes, I agree. You know, you know Bruce, you, you brought up some very interesting points so far in the program, and and I, I for one of the reasons I really get angry 
with the Democrats, this for much of what you had to say earlier, is that, you know, we have a foreign policy that has been taken out of public debate completely, okay? Everybody just reads the scripts from the Pentagon. You know, CNN is great in cheering on every single war the U.S. ever goes uh, out to fight. You know, and, and this identity politics at home is a huge distraction, intentional in many ways, so people don't look what's being done in the name of the United States around the world. And, and you know what? The America is strongly resented for that. Americans don't know what their country is doing in their name. Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. This fixation on identity politics, and we spend more time thinking about where we're going to the bathroom than turning children into orphans and wives into widows on an industrial scale, uh, making foreign countries a wilderness and wondering why we got 65 million refugees fleeing everywhere. I mean, it is a total disgrace and a total turning upside down the sense of priorities. I also want to remark about the, you know, the, the Trump revolution. The same thing was said about the Obama revolution. He's going to have a, a new constituency. Everything was going to change with Obama. And I had written early on, he said, no, it's not going to change. The military-industrial counterterrorism complex that Eisenhower warned against in 1961 remains. And so even though Obama came in on, no, he's going to get us out of the wars, he ends up giving Trump nine wars to inherit with no end in sight, no ability ability even to define what victory is, spending a trillion dollars when you include the Veterans Administration and the nuclear armaments of the Energy Department, a, a year on national defense. And what do we get for it? 15, 16 years after 9-11, our top experts in counterterrorism say we've never been more in danger than ever before because we're creating enemies faster than we're killing them. It's like searching the world for hornets' nests, bursting them open, and wondering why we have to fight the hornets that we've created. And if that doesn't stop, it won't matter whether you've got a Republican or Democrat, Mr. Trump or someone else, we will fall to ruination like all other empires. And I'm worried that the next conflict is not going to be with ISIS, it will be with Mr. China where we've already basically drawn a line and said, if you try to visit your islands in the South China Sea, 6,000 miles away from the United States, we're going to deny you access. The Chinese have been the victims of Western imperialism for centuries, and they're going to say, enough is enough. We got nuclear weapons. We're drawing the line here. We will fight. Okay. It's, that's very interesting. If I go to Bradley, I, I think the whole talk with, with Iran and China at this very early stage in this administration is basically putting out um, a, a, a bargaining position. It's kind of it's making a signal here. We'll, we'll see where it goes. I, I've made it very clear to our viewers here that I will stick with the tradition of 100 days before I make any strong judgment one way or another. I believe in giving a, a democratically legitimate president a chance to prove himself, and I'm going to do that with Mr. Trump. After the 100 days, we'll see here. Bradley, let's go back to what you were saying earlier, because I think a movement can be made in these red states, and if they stay red states, is that if Trump keeps his word. And I think that's the most important thing here. And of right. course, of course, the three other things, jobs, jobs, and jobs, okay? Because that's yeah. what counts mm -hmm. the most. And I think given the... Um, really uh, frank stupidity of the of the Democrats. I mean, I, I can't think of any other way to describe them right now. And if Trump keeps his word on the, some very basic things that matter to real people, not to Wall Street and not to some foreign interests, that those two things together will give them traction. Go ahead, Bradley. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Trump is a bottom line transactional president. He's, he's not beholden to politics, and he's not beholden to ideology. He's the most dangerous politician or president because his constituency is himself and his, and his policy and what he believes is right for the country. His challenge is to get Republicans, who are now in power in the Congress, to accept the president's uh, policies. And look, he's not going to rule by a pen and a phone. He's a deal maker. He's going to rule by legislation. He's going to invite the Democrats to the table, but if they're not sitting there, they're not going to get anything to eat. And at the bottom line for Donald Trump will be, has he kept his promises? Has he created jobs? Has he made the world a safer place? And I happen to believe that he's not going to be a folly for the generals. If anything, they're going to have a guy who's going to say, what is the bottom line are we going to win? How are we going to win? How much is it going to cost? He's going to be their worst nightmare because he hasn't been part of the establishment for 20 or 30 years that got him to the White House. You know, you know, H.A., if I can go back to you in Los Angeles, 
I mean, instead of the, 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 the only way the Democratic Party is going to survive all of this here is if they reform themselves. Now, they haven't had that, that uh, um, Hail Mary moment of you looking inward. Are they going to do it at this point? Because just being obstructionist, and I want to be fair here, when Obama was president, there was a lot of obstruction against him as well. So let's keep it 50 50 here. But at the same time, you know, not uh, wanting to vote uh, for the Supreme Court nominee, uh, uh, slowing down nominations for other cabinet. And seats and things like that. I mean, are they really doing themselves any kind of favor at all? Well, if the Democratic Party doesn't reform itself, Trump will certainly be reelected in 2020. The same things that got Trump elected. Uh, Democrats are blaming Russia, the Electoral College, um, uh, all these excuses for Hillary Clinton's $1.2 billion <laughs> failure. So she, ra she spent $1.2 billion. Jeez. Democrats spent $1.2 billion. And if God. you look, there's a fracture within the Democratic Party. There are, there are actually pundits and writers still blaming Bernie Sanders or yep. Bernie Sanders voters or Jill Stein voters or yep. people who didn't rally around the establishment. So the issue is where Trump wins or where Trump does well is he appeases his base. Republicans are very good at addressing the concerns of their base. Democrats are not very good at addressing the concerns of their base. What they do is they say, if you don't go and take a centrist position, Republicans will win. So even if Hillary Clinton engaged in racism, mm. or even if Democrats are corporatist, or even if Democrats send Americans, like President Obama sent Americans to Syria, to Iraq, kept Americans in Afghanistan, nobody said anything. If you, if you write an offensive tweet, that's worse than an airstrike under President Obama that kills over 70 civilians. Oh, hardly anyone AJ, talked about that in AJ, the media. AJ, I get so tired and so worrisome when you speak so logically. Okay, I mean, you're really going to knock some people out of their <laughs> seats by, by, by saying, say, you know, usually the simplest answer is the right answer. Okay, and you are, are, are perfection when it comes to simplicity here. You know, Thank Bruce, you. something I've noticed. Thank you, Peter. Since, since yeah. the inauguration, is it there's been... I was going to add the, this. That okay. it's, it's a, go, go ahead, real quick, okay? You want to add I one I just thing? wanted to add, this is a, a bipartisan pathology here. It, when uh, President W. Bush was in office, you know, when he came out for the, the TARP program, the trillion-dollar bailout, suddenly all the free market Republicans turned around and you're describing the Democrats as hypocr hypocritical. They all said, well, this was necessary. It was indispensable that we spend $16 trillion bailing out free market economy. So it's not, unfortunately, a disease that afflicts only the Democrats. But go okay. ahead, Peter. Or, okay. I, I, I was just going to say, and I, you know, let, me go to, let, me, let me go to Bradley with this one here. Bradley, one of the most important me, uh, media narrative uh, shifts that have happened since the inauguration is now everything is Donald Trump's fault. Donald Trump has dethroned Vladimir sure. Putin. Vladimir Putin has been dethroned, is, a, is the master of the universe and the problems of the world. You know, as I wrote in Facebook, you know, Putin had a good run of it, though, okay? But now it's Donald Trump. Uh, this, again, this is, I, starting out, I started out with this program, and I continue to, in all my programs, to talk about the lack of responsibility of the media. They don't, they don't do their homework. They're lazy, and they look for these very simple McCarthyite uh, answers, and, and they pull it out of air. Okay, go ahead, Bradley. Well, Peter, the bottom line is this. Donald Trump doesn't care yeah. about the media. He's one of the first presidents who doesn't wake up in the morning and, and gather his people around and go, how are the polls? What are the press saying? What do we need to do? How do we need to soften our position? Do we need to say anything different? How should we uh, couch this to the media? He says, you know what? I don't care about the media. I tell them I don't care about the media to their face, and I tell it when I'm on the air. So they're the most uh, perplexed of anybody because the media doesn't know what to do to Donald Trump because they've thrown everything at him yeah. about the kitchen sink, and he throws it back. If the press were smart, they'd play chess with Donald yeah. Trump, not Russian roulette. Okay, you know, I've said it before, Donald Trump well, is, is, yeah, Donald, Trump is, is Donald Trump is a weeble. It wobbles, but it doesn't fall down. Okay, guys, we've run out of time. Many fall thanks down. to my guests <laughs> in Washington and in Los Angeles, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, Crosstalk Rules. I love you.